so cold. You ever seen fire at zero gravity? It's beautiful. I was a big fan of science fiction from, from when I was a kid. You know, I used to read all those trashy paperback books. Um, all those science fiction books with really great um, front covers. And, uh, and, and really, so I've loved science fiction since I was a kid. And in terms of cinematic influences, I, I, I was always heavily influenced by American cinema and French cinema. Um, when I was growing up, there wasn't anything particular in, in British cinema that I really, really liked and responded to. So my influences are more from continental Europe than from America. Event Horizon first came to our attention because we were looking for a very scary project. We'd just done Mortal Kombat and Shopping, which were quite light projects, and Paul wanted something very dark. At that point, he was particularly obsessed with The Shining. Um, I sent the script of Event Horizon uh, by Paramount Pictures. Um, I just, I just done my second film, my first movie in Hollywood, which was Mortal Kombat, which was uh, had been a big hit in the States. Um, so I got sent quite a lot of scripts. And we heard about the script of Event Horizon, and Larry Gordon and Lloyd Levin had been developing it with Paramount, and they sent it over to us, and it was really interesting because it was a ghost story, but it was in space. In Philip's original script, the the reason for the, the kind of manifestations and the haunting, as it were, is that uh, there were aliens, um, they were kind of like these tentacular aliens that, and the event horizon had been to their planet or been to their dimension, and the aliens are kind of, were inhabiting the spaceship. And uh, I didn't want to go in that direction because, in my opinion, there's one great monster in space, and that's the alien, and I didn't want to make a monster movie in space. My first reaction to Philip Eisner's script was this was a terrific concept, but it was very dense. It was a little bit overwritten, and the story got a little bit lost. Um, the, the concept wasn't ultimately very clear. Paramount felt this was a great concept, but they needed a vision. So Paul came along and said, I'm going to make a really terrifying ghost story in space. I wanted to make a a more traditional classic haunted house movie. And I think what's good about movies like The Shining and also another movie that had a big influence on this film, um, which was Robert Wise's The Haunting, you know, those movies, they don't show you the monster, they don't show you the ghosts, they don't show you the creature. And I think that's very important for, for why those movies have remained classic films. And incidentally, why those movies, when they were first released, weren't big successes. You know, The Shining was not a big hit when it first came out. It was considered a disappointment. It didn't get great reviews. And it slowly became a classic over time. I think, you know, for the reason that, you know, what the fuck is that ending about? I mean, who knows? You know, the ending of The Shining, it's not definitive. It doesn't tell you exactly what happened. Um, and I think it's those kind of ambiguities, which you also find in The Haunting, Robert Wise's version, that make those classic films. Um, and for that reason, I didn't want aliens in the movie. I wanted something less specific than that. I like the whole idea of hell. I like the whole idea of the ship itself being possessed rather than going, oh, it's an alien consciousness that's doing this. My first task as the producer on Event Horizon was to establish where we were going to shoot this film. Uh, Larry Gordon gave me a great deal of freedom as, as, a, as his producing partner and colleague on the film, which I really am grateful for and respect. We needed a lot of stages. Paul wanted to build a lot. Paul has a tremendously strong visual imagination and he wanted the ship to be unlike anything you've ever seen. He wanted it to have a very religious uh, overtone. So the first, my first task was to twofold, to find the, the place in England that I could actually shoot this, that had enough stages available, and then to find the production designer. Pinewood at that time had enough space. I think Stanley Kubrick was just finishing or in the middle of Eyes Wide Shut, which had been sh shooting for about <laughs> two years at that point. Um, but we had enough, uh, they had enough stages for us, particularly the Bond stage. We needed a very big stage because the, uh, the scene in the daylight space station where you are in on Sam Neill in his little cubicle and he's, he's shaving. And <laughs> Mm. 
and we pull out, we pull out, we pull out. That was a massive shot. It required like a 60-foot track, um, uh, so it's revealing that he's in, he's in space. So I needed a stage that was big enough for that. I also needed a stage that had a tank. So the Bond stage in Pinewood was ideal. Then I had to uh, get a production designer. And Paul has a, a, a kind of co-designs a lot of his movies. So I needed a designer who was really very collaborative. And we met Joseph Bennett, um, who had really only done one notable film. But it was a great film, this film, uh, uh, Jude, that. Um, uh, based on the Jude the Obscure book by Thomas Hardy and it had a really interesting visceral style to it which Paul really responded to so uh, we gave him the gig and now that was a big gig for a young designer but as I said Larry Gordon and the studio gave us quite a lot of freedom to just bring in the people we wanted. Paul Anson's brief was very loose but said you know what we want to try and do is let's try and achieve a space film with a look that hasn't been seen before which is a, a nebulous brief and very challenging because you know the trouble with anything set in space is that there's so much his history about designs of movies set in space that it's very difficult to do something completely different without it looking arch or over designed and I think it's a you know it's a difficult balance to achieve between having something that looks kind of phony or over designed and having something that looks realistic and I, it's a balance that you know we we were very kind of conscious of, I think, on Event Horizon. Joseph set about designing this ship, and Paul came up with this idea that the, the ship should be like Notre Dame Cathedral. So the ship has a very long center piece, which is like an aisle, and at the end, it's like an altar. So immediately you're watching this movie and you're going into something a little metaphysical with these religious overtones, because essentially the ship is going to take you to hell. <laughs> We scanned Notre Dame Cathedral into the computer in LA and, uh, and then we kind of deconstructed it and tried to build a spaceship out of it. So the, the kind of the side thruster portions of the event horizon are actually the towers of Notre Dame Cathedral turned on their side. And a lot of that, you know, really did find its way into the movie. Um, all of the metal superstructure of the event that's all in the central section, um, that is all based upon the designs of the stained glass window from Notre Dame Cathedral. So, so there's an awful lot, if you ever go visit that cathedral, you do see the event horizon. Paul was constantly pushing and saying, well, how can we do this better? How can we make this? more exciting. He had this great phrase which is more is more. And you can see things like in the medical bay for example you see the big fat um, stone pillars that you'd find in a gothic cathedral. You see stained glass windows. When Jason Isaacs is crucified it's in front of you know a triptych of stained glass windows but they're kind of rendered in a very modern form. Because we had such a short prep time um, we needed you know a lot of good people and we were very fortunate with some fantastic fantastic crew um, obviously working at Pinewood Studios working at one of the premier film studios in the UK um, you know there's some fantastic crew available and we um, uh, we had like several art directors for example because so many big sets that needed looking after and building concurrently um, we had I think maybe four art directors, big team of people drawing stuff up. It was, you know, it was a big show. Paramount gave me a pretty, um, you know, they, they gave me pretty free reign to choose the crew that I wanted. So uh, all of the crew were, were handpicked by, by me. Um, you know, that happens in Hollywood. If your last movie was a big hit, you could really get to do whatever you want. Adrian Biddle is an astonishing DP. I've never known a DP be able to light so brilliantly uh, without moving from his seat beside the monitor. He sits there with his cigar and his black coffee and his copy of the London Times and he's got all of these electricians running all over the place doing these huge lighting designs and he just it just looks like he's putting he looks so he does it with so much ease he's so confident he's so experienced. You know he gets a lot of offers he's a very in-demand cameraman and I really wanted him so I kind of I wooed him over so what I did was when I I met him I took a whole reference book of photographs of what I thought the look of the movie should be. So, uh, you know, shots of, just a lot of photography, like shots of corridors that had 
unbalanced fluorescent lights in them so that the, the negative, when you print it, um, the photograph comes out with that kind of cyan green, which is, we always called unpleasant green because it, like, it, it just looks unpleasant, it makes you feel unsettled. And that was the kind of look that I wanted for the interior of the event horizon. And I took him a lot of kind of architectural photographs as well. And I think he was, he was, you know, he was obviously very excited by the vision that I had for the movie and then he built upon that. So he was actually the first person we signed to the picture. I remember we had Adrian Biddle on board before we signed any of the actors. You know, so it was very much a, it was very much a design and look led movie. You know, because you had the director and the DP working on it before you really had any of the actors involved in it. You know, we were building the sets again before we were fully cast. I mean, he's just, he's just a genius. I mean, we, we were so lucky to have him and he really helped us on this film because we had quite a young crew in certain areas, but visual effects, we had Richard Urisic, tremendous experience. Adrian Biddle, you know, worked with Jim Cameron. He did Aliens, he was the focus puller on Alien. Tremendous amount of experience, but then pockets of, of, of young talent like Joseph Bennett, the designer, um, which is really how Paul and I like to do it. We like to mix it up. You don't want to have everybody who's done 30 odd movies. It's nice to have some young energy and some, some new ideas in there, as well as the experience. But Biddle was uh, just extraordinary. I mean, honestly, he would sit there and achieve great things, and it made it look like it was so easy. Nothing would ever fluster him. And we do some shots that I just, uh, to this day, I think Event is, it's got the best looking stuff I ever shot in it. It's got some amazing shots. And Adrian would never admit anything. You, you just shoot these amazing looking shots and you go, oh, that's, uh, that's nice. And that would be the most you'd ever get out of him. You know, nice was as good as we ever got. I was very excited to work with John Mollo because um, obviously I'm heavily influenced by the works of, of Ridley Scott, who is a, you know, a genius and one of the best filmmakers living today. And uh, I was excited to work with John Mollo because he obviously works on the first Alien movie. And um, for two reasons I was excited to work with him. One, he was very talented, obviously, but also he'd encountered a lot of the difficulties that we were going to encounter before. So for example, the way that in the first Alien, all of the helmets fog up, which actually looks quite cool um, in, in Ridley's movie, but was a mistake. You know, it, it was really difficult apparently to work in those helmets. And they only spent a small portion of the movie in the helmets. We we're gonna spend a lot more time with our characters wearing the helmets, so we couldn't afford them to fog up. And John had all that kind of experience. You know, he knew where to put little fans inside the helmets to keep the actors cool, to make sure the faceplate wouldn't uh, mist up. Um, he was a very, you know, an unusual thing for a, a costume designer is to be very talented when it comes to like the flair of designing costumes, but also combine that with great practicality, uh, which is something we had to do. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Unzip your flight suit and then take off. Oh. No, no sorry. Yeah. What, what I want to do is keep your t shirt, yeah? Yeah. And then take the arms off and then kind of wrap them around. You know how you wear flight suits when they're, they're half down? Yeah. That's it. It was one of the problems we had on the film was the actors were just weighed down by the spacesuits. They took forever to put on, you know, it took like 45 minutes to get them in the boots, the suits, the big backpacks, the helmets. Then once they were in those suits, they could only spend like 10 minutes in them because the weight was so incredible that they just couldn't stand it. Even physically big, tough guys like Fishburne, he just couldn't stand up for more than five, 10 minutes. So we ended up building these uh, resting posts for them that were, because they couldn't sit in a standard chair because they would just break the chair. Um, and also they couldn't sit down because the backpack wouldn't allow them to. So we built these kind of leaning posts and they would, uh, they would just lean against them and get a bit of rest. It was, uh, you know, for the actors, it was a movie that was filled with physical discomfort. Lawrence Fishburne is uh, an awesome individual. He has such gravitas, such presence. Um, I, I, I was very, very excited to be working with him. Um, you know, he, he uh, was extremely professional. Um, 
he he really it's great when you have a, an actor like that within your crew within your cast because he sets a standard you know this man was in apocalypse now you know um obviously this was before matrix but he still was such a big star for paul and i he'd done so many movies that we really liked but he was really easy to work with um but one of the great things about him is you just cut to him and he's got such presence he doesn't really have to do much so he's he's worth millions of dollars just in that presence alone you know the rules people someone drops the ball we get the call now let's go fish loved the movie uh that was um you know he really really liked it i met a friend of mine met him in new york about a year and a half after he'd finished filming event horizon and uh he was wearing his full outfit you know the flight suit the captain miller flight suit I was very intimidated by working with Lawrence because he's a big American film star and he's kind of very cool and charismatic and um you know he's nominated for an Oscar and he's you know he's just a brilliant actor so the first day that I worked with him or rather he was doing a scene I came to visit the set and I was introduced and he shook my hand and I kind of went a little bit and uh he he did something I think he walked across a room looking for something and then he came over and stood next to me while we were watching the playback and he went do you think that was all right was what me he said yeah was that what do you think that was all right i said yeah, uh well yeah it was it was great really yeah, anything like I said well and then i made some comment i god only knows why i made some vaguely critical comment about you could have gone and looked in the cupboard or something and he went okay and uh he went away and i thought what did i do why did i just tell lawrence fishburne how to look in the cupboard I'm, but we uh we hit it off like we got on incredibly well and uh in order not to be intimidated by his general superstardom and macho coolness i called him florence and uh, uh and then the rest of the crew took it up <laughs> it was called florence by a lot of people which i think took him by surprise at first but he uh, he took it in good stead after a while one of my favorite memories of fish though is is actually off the set he was such a cool guy um and we set up this gym because uh, all of the actors had to do a lot of wire work in the space suits they had to be hung upside down they were put into harnesses and it's physically very difficult so they had to be in very very good shape um so we had a big gym set up at pinewood for the actors and they'd go in there at the end of the day and at that point in my life I was still trying to remain slightly fit so I would go running at the end of the shooting day and uh and I went into the gym and there was just me and fish and he his favorite exercise was to hang upside down from these gravity boots you know those bars that you hang upside down from so I walk into the gym and he's hanging upside down cuz usually he do like sit ups upside down he's hanging upside down like a big bat looking really he's the only guy who can hang upside down and look cool so he's hanging upside down and he says hi paul and we have this conversation and we talk about this and we talk about that and slowly he works his way around to what he really wants to say which is he can't get up but he's too cool just to get to the point and go oh poor I can't get up give me a hand we have to have a whole conversation first and then eventually his cuz his stomach muscles were like so exhausted and then i had to kind of help him up but he was he was a uh, he was a great guy to work with i i i hope we will work together again sam neil um also terrific uh very professional you know we we had a very social time on that film um I uh, I I may I gave the the cast membership to this new club I just opened in Soho the Soho House and every Friday night we I would take a room there and we would all sit around and talk and we became we became friends and and Sam is still a a very good friend and a an excellent actor I mean like Paul and I were only uh, 29 30 years old so it was great to have this experience behind us I'd always seen Sam playing these authority figures he plays you know kind of reactionary figures he's often buttoned up and and repressed and uh I was rather taken aback at what kind of loose free spirit he is kind of embodying I don't know about the 60s but whatever he is he's certainly not the character he plays on screen it took me a while to to make the adjustment and realize he was a real love and uh, incredibly mischievous and uh he was there with his wife Nerica and they were they just loved to have a good time and they were you know when we all went out they were the last people to leave and uh So he was is one of the people that was tremendously good fun to do a scene with because I don't think he takes acting uh too seriously. Not that he's not very good at it, but I think he thinks it's a rather silly way to make a living and that comes across when you work. 
The one thing I can say about Sam Neill is, uh, is if you've never worked with him, please keep your fingers crossed that you're going to work with him because he is the guy. He's really quiet, very calm, you know, doesn't suffer fools. Yeah. Amazing person to, to apply prosthetics on. I think Mark found that because uh, he's just there. He he's so professional. And he was very nice to us, and he's got his own vineyards, and he gave us all a nice bottle of wine at the end of the film. He's a great guy. Really fantastic. Oh, and he did, he loves watching. I mean, the makeup call was, was horrific. One o'clock in the morning, there was the makeup call. Then Sam was on set for all day, and then a couple of hours to take off the makeup in the evening. And uh, he was just fantastic. The makeup was being applied because he had to sit there for, or stand there for so many hours. The Jungle Book was fantastic. He did tell us off for singing along and, uh, and kept telling us we might have to, you might have to turn the film off because we were singing King of the Swings, you know, all that. Anyway. <laughs> Sam Hill just gave so much to this movie. Um, the end of the film where he had to be in a full prosthetic suit, which I'm sure Pauline Fowler has told you how long it took to get into that. I mean, he, he would come to work I think it was like three o'clock in the morning, so that they could spend seven or eight hours putting all of this makeup on him, all of these plastic pieces. We'd then shoot with him for about five hours. He'd be awake, having the stuff put on, having the stuff taken off, and have to deliver a performance. Um, so he really, he gave so much to the film. And also, incidentally, we were shooting this at uh, Pinewood Studios on the Bond stage in the middle of winter. And the Bond stage is just like a big tin hut. There's no heating in there and it's freezing cold and Sam's naked underneath all these little plastic pieces because he has to be so he's like freezing his bollocks off as well uh, in a, a tremendous discomfort and all we're doing is like ladling more and more freezing cold blood all over him. Kathleen Quinlan who we saw who we'd seen in the doors that's why we we, we hired her we thought she was very strong in that uh, interestingly she had a young son in real life and her character has this child and She'd had to leave her husband and her child in America to do this film in England, which was echoing her character in the film, who had had to go, to sp go into space to answer this distress call from the Event Horizon, the ship that was, had disappeared, you know, 20 years earlier. Um, so I think, there was, I think she brought a lot of that real-life feeling into her part. I mean, I really, really think you feel for her when, when she, she's, she's, she's missing her child and she's feeling guilty about her child. And she very cleverly brought that in there. Um, and I think the cast all... I mean, everybody has something you're guilty about. Everyone has done something horrific. And I think they all tapped into that a little bit. They didn't always tell me what it was. <laughs> but uh, I, I'm sure, certainly, they, they all had their, their dark pasts. Kathleen Quinlan was, was, I mean, I, I love the cast of this movie, so, you know, I have nothing but great things to say about them. She was, uh, she was terrific to work with, you know, really so feisty. And, and I think some of the scariest stuff in the movie is stuff that she was involved in in the medical bay. Peters! <laughs> That's what I've learnt is the more movies I've done, I mean, really what sells the horror is, is what you see in somebody's eyes. You know, that's what sells the, if you're doing a monster movie, that's really what sells the guy in the rubber suit is the monster is the person who's reacting to it. You know, do they really, really look scared? And I think, you know, that's some of my favorite stuff in the movie is where Kathleen's in the medical bay because she looks genuinely terrified. Well, Kathleen was a bit of a, um, although she's hardly older than me at all, but she was, she was a, a, a mum and she, she felt like a very safe place to go to, Kathleen. She's also a magnificent actress. Because what was weird about Event Horizon is that sometimes from a standing start, people had to go into incredibly extreme emotions because they were being confronted by their worst vision of themselves or whatever. And uh, she'd be standing around chatting and then be completely traumatized, like only a mum could be, you know, there's visions of her child running around. And I just remember being terribly impressed by her. And I find it easy to get bound up in the social atmosphere of work and forget that when they say action, you've got to do something extraordinary. And she reminded me all the time. Jolie Richardson, who I think, her character, as I remember, might have originally been written as a guy. I think, I, actually, I think L Lieutenant Stark was originally a guy. Um, that's one of the things that, <clears throat> when I cast, I always like to do, unless it's specific, it's, we'll read both kind of men and women for, for particular roles, because sometimes it's kind of like fun to flip it around and change it. Jolie was great. Um, she, uh, I'd never really done a part like this. You know, Jolie Richardson of the famous theatrical family, 
Um, so she'd done a lot of sort of more dr dramatic orientated British films. I don't think she'd done much with guns or stunts, and but she got really fit. She really embraced it, and we threw her around a lot. I mean, I mean, we just tossed her around. I mean, there's a scene at the end where the, the ship is breaking up and she's being sucked out and she's hanging on, and we've got, you know, big tank um, cannons blasting out air, and I mean, I mean, I, she was great, real trooper. Jolie, uh, Jolie would always make me laugh. I don't know why. Jolie, she just makes me laugh. Almost anything she says. I'm not sure she's trying to be funny most of the time either. Um, and she laughed uh, rather too loudly at lots of things I was saying when I really definitely wasn't trying to be funny. Uh, I think we got on very well and uh, have remained friendly since. You know, it's much easier to stay friendly with the English people because the Americans you don't see. Um, she, I think couldn't believe that she was in this science fiction film and saying some of the stuff to her was so alien she'd say it and turn around and go what am I talking about? Um, and then it was a rhetorical question but I would go to the bother of explaining what you know various force fields and black hole and worms were and she'd go I don't care. The antennae array is completely fried we've got no radio no laser no high gain no one's coming to help us. 